know that Kelly, you know, is running late and I want to make sure that she's able to get all of it. And then I also think it might be great just to have it in case you think, what was that crazy stuff that Rachel brought up the other day that seemed a little outside the box? So we're being incredibly subversive today. And that's what I've entitled this conversation is subversive science. Please stop me at any point today. If there's something that just doesn't make sense or seems a little bit crazy and you want to talk a little bit about it, I definitely really, really enjoy this discussion. So this is a, a critical discussion of positivism. Has anybody ever heard that term or used that term? Heard it used? Not so much, okay. Positivism is really another way of saying the reductionist certainty of the scientific method. So the way uh, positivism is another term for the way in which we do science uh, through hypothesis testing, I guess, if you will. Um, and then approach for creating inclusive environments in science. So I want to start, and I can use this board over here, with what, what are the cornerstones? And we've been, like, we've spent the entire semester now really practicing the scientific method. What would you say are some of the cornerstones of the scientific method? If you were trying to explain it to maybe your you know, 10 year old nephew, and you want to explain what it takes to do something using the scientific method. What are some things that would, you would say? Good. Expound upon that just a little bit, Caleb. Right, good. Okay, cool. So experiment in, in the lab. I think that's an important part of it, right? And we might broaden that out to the field sometimes, though it's much more commonly in the lab. And we can think about and talk about why that is. Testability of what? Hypotheses. Good. So testability of hypotheses. Which, of course, once you design experiments to test hypotheses, which you've now all done throughout the semester, in many ways you have now regenerated what? More hypotheses, <laughs> which there will give more experiments, right? So in a lot of ways, we could say that this is really quite circular. You know, we can say we put out testable hypotheses, do experiments to test them, and then get more hypotheses, which we then continue that circle. And one could kind of say that that is the cornerstone of science. I mean, really, this is the continuous rolling snowball that leads to the progression of testing those things that maybe are seemingly unknown at this point. So this, I think, really does a pretty nice job of explaining the, the scientific method. Historically, though, you may not have actually known that this is a very long history. Um, the scientific method could be attributed even to uh, Muslim groups prior to being attributed to Aristotelian philosophers. Who were some of those famous dudes? Socrates <laughs> and his protege, Plato, you got it. And so Plato, he says, and this, realize, I want you to think about what this challenge is. He says, there can be no knowledge until it is observed through man's eye. What is that? I don't know. What does that kind of challenge um, at that point in time in, in, in Greece and Rome? What was maybe the primary means towards enlightenment? Say it again. The church. The church. Exactly. So this was the first move away from the church. 
really saying that this is something that science is different than religion. And one of the main reasons that it's different is because it asks us to see something before we believe it, to make observations on a phenomenon that we can actually um, recognize, right? A natural phenomenon that we can see and we can make notes on in our, our, our notebook. Now, this rolled into something that was criticized very much. And, you know, bear in mind that this is hundreds of years that pass here. But by the time we hit the Enlightenment, this Plato's philosophy and the Aristotelian method of doing science was criticized pretty greatly by Francis Bacon and other Enlightenment scholars. So what was their criticism? Well, the criticism was that, in fact, um, these methods of just observing nature weren't testable. Or let's say it this way. You're observing some natural phenomenon, right? What element of what we think of as the scientific method now is kind of missing from that? What do we, ah, I know how to get to this. Why is this so important? Controls, right? And so this element or level of control began to be integrated into the scientific method. So it's the idea that we have an independent variable which we change and we look at the impacts on the dependent variable it's highly controlled. We do it in the lab so that we can try to make sure that there's no confounding um, anything that would, that would affect our ability to test only the impact of one variable change on another. And to do this circular science of experiments, hypotheses, hypotheses, experiments, and more hypotheses, and more experiments, right? So this was kind of the overarching theme uh, of control, control of the variables, that really was a big part of the enlightenment. And I know, I know that there's quite a number of you in here who've taken a lot of honors courses. When I say enlightenment or I say renaissance, what comes to your mind? I mean, there's some image or there's some thought that that provokes. What is it? What? Art, good. The Ifutsi, right? Um, you know, the academy, like these brilliant artists of the time. And I think, um, rightly, we can say that it was a period of great creation, uh, a lot of artistic liberty, a lot of scientific freedom, right? Uh, ability to inquire. And it was wonderful in a lot of ways. But I want your mind to begin to ponder in that environment who was liberated and who wasn't. Okay. So um, the Newtonian paradigm, this is also known as the mechanistic paradigm, sees nature as a machine composed of related but discrete components. And if you will, this comes back to our scientific method which if we add in another element to this and to the idea of positivism, it would be reductionism, which is kind of the opposite of holistic thinking, right? It's the idea that if we distill things to their most discrete unit, we can somehow uncover the truth of what makes some larger system be what it is. So the, the, more, minute, the more minute we can become, and you still see this in science, right? It's actually really interesting to think about the hierarchies of science, and I bet you guys think about this a lot. What is the, you know, you're talking to, um, you know, Joe Blow on the street, and you're like, what is the hardest major, the one that is the most rigorous? 
engineering, right? Which is, by definition, the most mechanistic of paradigms, right? The most reductionist of sciences. So it's interesting that although we find ourselves so much later on down the road, we still are like Francis Bacon and Newton and this mechanistic paradigm, we still have a lot of value. We prescribe clout to those who are the most reductionist in their science, the most ability to see nature as a machine, okay? So to composed of discrete but related components. Interesting, right? Okay, so we are setting the stage. <laughs> this quote, I want you to read it. And then I want you to turn to the person next to you and pick out maybe a few key words that you think have meaning or interest to you. And talk with the person next to you and, and see if there's anything that you might both come up with different things that jumped out at you or things you would think, you know, I would highlight in that passage if it were one of my school books, right? And I mean, Caleb and Jenny and Dalton can talk in threes if you would like. <laughs> I'll make a list over here. What would you highlight? What would what would your group highlight? I think <laughs> it's all very highlightable. It is highlightable. I mean, Francis Bacon, after all. <laughs> I'm I'm just stuck on my mind. There you go. Yeah, that's what I would also have highlighted. Did your group disagree? Uh, yeah, pretty pretty well. Okay. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, this, this line, um, I'll try not to make too many marks on this board because I know how hard it is to erase, but um, man as a mirror or glass capable of the image of the universal world. Is that what you also highlighted? I heard you guys talking about it. Yeah, maybe. And, and certainly um, the, the, the following line is another way to say basically the same thing. And it's really what jumps out because what he is explaining here is that there is a truth of nature. So if we are just a clean enough glass, we can be the um, translator of the truth of nature which at this point in time, right, is so pretty inextric inextricably linked to God, too, right? So it's the, it, the truth of nature. We can be the, like, looking glass that somehow makes that truth known. So we can, like, translate it into, you know, our notebooks. If we're, if we're just clean enough, if we're clear enough, if we're able to, right, do that. 
So with this in mind as sort of the backbone of what it meant to be a scientist, image yourself for a moment as that thing. You are that glass or you are that looking glass through which the truth of nature makes itself known. And think about where that puts you and how it makes you feel. The scientific method, as all of you told me over here, we come back, right, to the fact that we're controlling the experiment. This is actually interesting. This is a passage from one of the Gen Bio books. As you can see, it's one of the older Gen Bio books. But I thought it was an interesting one to pull out because in the beginning of the book, of course, they cover the scientific method and they talk about what it means. So simplify observations in nature or the laboratory by manipulating and controlling the conditions under which observations are made. This quote really nicely adds that other layer of it, what it means to do science. Right? So this is where we begin to deconstruct <laughs> and to get a little bit subversive as we think about what it means to control nature. Um, the attempt to impose rationality and scientific order upon organic vegetative matter, um, the attempt right, to completely control everything in our mushroom growth so that we could specifically monitor single variables that might impact that. So now I get to ask you the big question. And I want you to talk about this a little bit because it may be that different answers come up. So with whom do we associate nature? So I want you to talk about that question, simple question. I could probably, I, <laughs> yeah, I could probably also say with the, what peoples do we associate nature with another way to phrase that. So talk about it a little bit, talk about it. <laughs> yeah, I mean, f feel free to, to be subversive or to be like honest, right? Like of what comes to your mind. It's, it's, that's what I'm looking for. So. You know, and another way that I could phrase this too would be to say, um, think about it as the wild. <laughs> I haven't seen it. I watched it for about 10 minutes. What is it called again? <laughs> naked and afraid. Naked and afraid. Like drop on an island. Uh, an island. Naked. Just with nothing. Yeah. Okay. That actually has some interesting connotations mm -hmm. that might I feel like that's be yeah. discussed. Yeah. 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 It's super interesting. I was thinking about today, you know, how some of this image may, may be changing, but did um, anything come up for you guys right away or? Yeah, okay, good. Yeah, yeah, good. I like that. <laughs> no, I mean, I, I actually think it's interesting how that is sort of changing some of this perception. It's actually, in this, like, it's an interesting side discussion we probably won't have today. Because what Jenny was saying is like granolas, right? Yeah. Like Col Colorado granolas, you know? Which I, I, I think is, it's got some merit, and it's another discussion, I think, pretty much. But um, ladies, did you have a few things? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. 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 Yeah. Yeah. We could say that because I mean Darwin certainly um, much of what made Darwin's science different 
is that he was observing in the natural state, which actually made him at the time a very subversive scientist. So that's, that's a good point. And then what was the other one? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Certain people, maybe, particularly. Yeah. How about you guys? Yeah. Indigenous peoples of all types, right? I thought that Jenny said something else when you first started off. Did you have another one that came up at the beginning? No? I think I may say hippie. <laughs> <laughs> but I mean that like fits too. I mean I think you know, I think I think that fits too. I think I think that's how you spell that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Natural, all natural. Yeah. Really yeah. Well, yeah. Like, yeah. Like, you know, organic product. Yeah. I, I, I think. Yeah. No, I I hear you. That's it's good. Um, and I think it's it's interesting. Like we could look historically versus because I think it probably does. It depends a little bit on the time reference that you're looking at. But, but I like I like that. I know the, the big one, you guys, that didn't come up, but I'm quite sure it's somewhere in your mind. Didn't you say that at the beginning? That's what I, oh, Dawson did. Mother Nature. Right. That's what I thought I heard. Yeah. So, okay. So, I think that this does a pretty good job of summarizing the types of people with whom we associate nature. There's probably one other I would add in there, garden fairy. And right? I know, right? And I think I think but I think it's like and I think it's while we know that uh, that connotation is uh <laughs> Right, right. So, I mean, as we, so here's where we, we start to get really subversive. And that is when you really look at who, and I think even hippies works, right? Because they're counterculture. The kinds of people with whom we associate nature or the wild tend to be people who are in at least our current culture very marginalized, right? Ranging from women to, um, those of African descent. And so we can now see things in a slightly different light. And I want to share a couple of quotes with you. This is a quote that comes out of my educational research book. It is the current educational research book. And some of you might recognize the quote. Go ahead and read it and tell me if you recognize the quote. Does anybody recognize that one? It's from a pretty, I think a pretty famous book, um, Zen and the Art of Motorcycle Maintenance. I actually have only read parts of the original book, but as I said, this quote was in my educational research book. So when they're talking about how to now, this is really interesting, how to approach educational research. They draw on this quote in a very literal way. Um, has anybody read Zen Art of Motorcycle? I have a feeling that in the context of the book, this might not be as literal as it is used in educational research book. But it's super interesting when you start to think about with whom we associate nature, and this quote, replace indigenous peoples with nature, replace woman with nature, right? And it is, I mean, it's an interesting, informative moment. Does anybody recognize this quote? Yeah. 
it's on the front of the engineering building <laughs> yeah so if you look go buy it later today if you have a chance strive on the control of nature is one not given and the control of nature for the service of man pretty informative right um this uh and i'm gonna i'm gonna zoom out here for a moment if i can um, this picture is, I thought, one that, uh, <laughs> that's, not, that's not a very good zoom, but self-portrait by Carly Sullivan, and I think it's a good one for showing as a woman, really feeling almost a part of nature, a piece of nature. So um, it was in about 2005 that I had my first moment of exposure to uh, deconstruction of the scientific method and it was probably one of the biggest most meaningful moments in my life because I had been succeeding in a chemistry um, degree and I actually graduated as the outstanding senior chemistry major from the University of Denver and I had um, get, been given offers to go to MIT and Northwestern to study Bioinorganic chemistry, protein chemistry is my area of interest. And I, um, I just was struggling a lot. And the worst part of that is that I couldn't figure out why. And I don't think it was until 2005 that I figured out why, because I was really successful. I mean, I was getting the top grades in chemistry. I was doing undergraduate research. In fact, I did so much undergraduate research that I helped organize the EPR convention in Denver, which is electron paramagnetic resonance. So I was good at science. Um, and for some reason, I ran the other way. Um, I ran to Wyoming because I knew that I could ski here. Uh, it wasn't a very popular choice with my mentor professors who worked 16 hours a day doing EPR and um, yeah, their treat to themselves was that on Sundays they would come in at nine and they would go out for breakfast. So, <laughs> um, you know, there's a lot of maybe interesting reasons that things were hard for me at that particular point. Um, but I think I found out in many ways after studying deconstruction of the scientific method why some of this was. So Mother Nature, wild savage, the native people of America were viewed as other. European culture was delineated, um, delineating the border, the hierarchical division between civilization and wildness. So that's one that we didn't end up getting up there, but like wild savage. And the association, if you will, of the indigenous peoples, particularly with the move um, of colonialism into the Americas, the indigenous peoples were very much associated with the nature. And a big part of that was what Noel said, is people who live with nature. Instead of being um, separated, whether that be like literally or figuratively from the nature that they're in, and from the physical surroundings of their environment, we often tend to see ourselves as even separate from the ecosystem. And that's a really interesting, in fact, just um, yesterday morning on my Twitter feed was an entire article about people who, scientists who view us as a part of the ecosystem that they study versus scientists that remove humans as a part of that ecosystem. And so it's interesting to think about it in, in that respect that uh, obviously we have associated um, those who are less intellectual with the natural world so this is a, a quote by uh, a feminist scholar. Above all, it is invited by the rhetoric that conjoins the domination of nature with the insistent image of nature as female, no more, no, nowhere more familiar than in the writings of Francis Bacon. For Bacon, knowledge and power are one, and the promise of science is expressed as leading to you nature with all her children to bind her to your service and make her your slave. So the Newtonian paradigm, back to that, right? AKA also called the mechanistic paradigm, um, presumed that all which did not operate according to reason, logic, part of the Renaissance 
was the operating or separating of body and mind. The most celebrated scholars were those who could live in here and not in here so much. So when we think about those celebrations uh, of the Renaissance, and you think about who was being enlightened, and it was really funny the other day I mentioned to someone that I consider myself a Renaissance man. And they said, Rachel, don't you mean you consider yourself a Renaissance woman? And I said, hell no. Because what were women doing during the Renaissance? <laughs> Cooking. <laughs> Not the art that we associate. Now there were a few that went outside the mold. They were subversive, right? They were the ones that were a little bit cray-cray. Witches that burned at the stake, right? <laughs> uh, often too often, yeah. Um, so yes, a Renaissance man as opposed to a Renaissance woman. <laughs> So, um, sorry, I'm back here for just a moment. Um, this, I thought, I just, I picked out a couple of images. Um, this one I thought was a beautiful piece of Aboriginal art. And I think in many ways it really captures the idea of um, Indigenous peoples living in their environment and being a part of, of nature. So this then comes to another point that some of you have really already pondered quite a bit, and that is technical jargon. So say that you are studying Brusella Bordis, and you situate yourself within Rael's community in Africa. And you think about the fact that the work that you're doing probably most intimately affects the people there. And yet, when we write the publication that I know one day will come from your work, for whom do we write? Other scientists. So we write to tickle the mind of other scholars. And in doing that, we exclude so many of the groups who are most impacted by the work that we're doing, and in theory, should be the benefactors of that work. So while majority groups are generally written about an active voice, um, this is a good passage. And if, if anyone has a little bit of a wish list reading list for over a break, Ronald Takaki writes a book called A Different Mirror. Different Mirror or A Different Lens. Different Mirror, I think. And um, he writes about the uh, basically the uh, fa founding of America through the lens of those who were marginalized. So it's just a different, it's like spinning. It's like the looking glass, right? A little bit of spinning the looking glass. And this is a quote that was taken from his book where he was quoting um, more. But other is often referenced in the passive voice. So when we talk about the European immigrants, we talk very actively like European immigrants conquered the new world. And then when we talk about the indigenous peoples, we say things like, um, you know, yeah, in, in indigenous peoples were cleared from the land, right? And so there's a very different way that we reference um, other. So I've integrated, you guys are getting this lecture for the first time in a little bit newly rebuilt format because I had this incredible opportunity to um, go to a woman scholar who studies Afrofuturism a while back. And this is actually an Afrofuturist piece by uh, Manzel Bowman. And um, I put a, a link on here and I will post these. Um, if you're interested in looking at a little more Afro, Afrofuturist work, um, but let's zoom in this uh, like for a minute and what would this piece of art say to you if you just saw it across the room in an art museum? Or, wealth. Yeah, good. Because it's like gold laden, 
you know so it's like yeah just laden in gold and yeah but there's a, a great song that comes up on my chill radio station that I walked into the room dripping in gold right <laughs> and this is I'm I mean talk about dripping in gold sure but what is the gold doing Go ahead, see. yeah yeah prevents her from seeing and speaking um, so I mean this is a pretty powerful piece of work and um, when Manziel Bowman talks about it he basically talks about the way in which black lives aesthetics and this is maybe the most poignant dreams and possibilities that have been lost to history so in a sense the silencing but of course the dreams are of the wealth and of the the privilege um, but certainly have in many ways been lost um, to history and it's it's interesting the afrofuturist movement is very pessimistic um, a lot of the songwriters um, artists they don't see necessarily a hopeful future of liberation but it's interesting because they also don't see a reason to stop working for that and i was so blown away when i went to the talk because that's a lot of how i feel about the world because i don't work for what i work for because I think that in my lifetime, I'm going to make those changes. I do it because I think it brings balance to the force. And fighting the fight is worth it. So I really, it really resonated with me. And I'll come back to that in a moment. So um, remember back now to this idea that came from reading the Francis Bacon quote of seeing uh, the truth of nature made clear through us as the lens. Did anybody ponder that or even have an emotional response to that or kind of a, even, or even an intellectual response to that? The idea of seeing yourself as a scientist like as the looking glass. I, I saw Noel pondering it. It's hard to know right now necessarily how that, like what that feels like to you. Um, so that was probably my greatest realization was that the reason that I was struggling so much in science is not because I wasn't succeeding. I was really, really good. Um, I could do science and I could get the grades. And, but the problem was that whenever I went to work, I just felt hollow. And retrospectively, it was the reason that I fell in love with teaching, which isn't an overstatement. I mean, I fell head over heels, blind love for teaching. I mean, even to the point of being incredibly reckless, like I left behind other things just to pursue teaching, you know. Um, and, and I think the reason for that, a big part of the reason for that was that when I taught, I didn't feel hollow. And I think that that was because I could see that I was impacting people every day. And so for, I think, you know, for everyone, I would actually argue, but I think in many cases for those who, and this is very true of me, like I certainly identify more with the nature that I'm studying than I do with the way that we study it. So, I mean, being one with that nature, being a part of or living with that nature. Um, so this is a quote um, that was from a work that I did in 2007. So rather than being the dispassionate observer of the truth of science, so this references Bacon's like looking glass. Um, women see the role of science as inherently linked and applied to their everyday life, inextricably tied to the wel welfare of those toward whom their emotional work is directed. So you all like, oh, I just felt almost Terry. <laughs> okay, let that pass. Um, you all are actually the benefactors of a lifetime of my own inquiry and pursuit of this because what is different about capstone? Why is it different? What is the major reason it's different than your other lab classes? Yes, it's independent. Good. And you're seeing the why. That's very good. What else? It's embedded in the community, and it's science for those who can't serve themselves. 
And so in so many ways, it is a manifestation of philosophical journey that I went through um, in designing what I consider inclusive pedagogy or inclusive curriculum. Sweet. So the true, this is the truth true of women both in the professional and their more traditional roles where they are often in the best position to notice certain ranges of environmental problems as they observe neighborhood patterns of children's illnesses, the funny look of washing machine water, or the peculiar smell of dirt in which their children play. One of my students this semester, um, her name is Anne Marie, and she's older than I am. She's just a beautiful person. But um, her husband just six months ago died of pancreatic cancer. He found out like he literally had three weeks to live, and it was very quick. Um, she has three kids, so she's a single, uh, a single mother. And it's really interesting because I watch in her the um, passion that she has for using science to make change. And it's amazing how her standpoint, like her frame of reference, really uh, brings this in and, and is really different than a traditional undergrad who maybe hasn't been in those shoes So this is our last critique before I hope we become a little bit more optimistic. So this is just simply that um, positivism and the scientific method um, asks you to be objective. So what is that? I mean, have you ever gotten that comment on your papers for a science report or something like, you know, you need to be objective about this or, or anybody who says to you, you need to be, you know, you're not capable of being objective, are you? What does that mean? You have a bias, right? Good. Um, so and the, pro the problem with that is that we all have biases, all of us, the fantastic, like, Twitter thing this morning about um, they took just did this study where they took a Quran and they disguised it as a Bible and then no wait no backwards backwards they took a Bible and they disguised it as a Quran and they went around and they read it to people and people were like I can't believe people believe that kind of thing as compared to the Bible which is full of so many kind and wonderful things and then it turned out it was Bible right and one of the quotes that was the best from that was that um, one of the women said, she literally said, I guess I had biases that I didn't know I had. And I think it was an interesting way to uncover some of those. So the point being is, yeah, <laughs> we're biased. We're all biased. And we all see the world through our lens. I mean, even if it's, if it's as simple as the fact that I see through a lens of um, someone who was raised in poverty, right? I see through that lens as compared to someone who sees through a lens that was raised with a lot of privilege. That does cause biases. We are all going to be biased. And so one of the critiques of, of, of the scientific method is that we try to achieve something that really we can't. And this is a critique that is strong in many areas. So whether you're talking about um, a feminist critique, which is true, or whether you're talking about um, the anthropologist's social science critique of hard sciences, many of those have looked towards recognizing bias and actually reporting bias. So this... Um, this passage, uh, yeah, it's a little tricky to read because it's like it was not translated very well. Do you un um, uh, recognize the person, the quoter? <laughs> yeah, and then Yvonne Leeuwenhoek. So I want you to read this and see if you, like in, oh, sorry, this came from his series of letters that went to the Royal Society of London um, around 1677. So go ahead and read it and see if you can see a good example of a way in which his observation is grounded in his standpoint. <laughs> yeah, just do your best. It's, it's the first um, I discovered in rainwater, you know, I, 
many times observed without being able to discern a lot of the F's or S's, any film that held them together or can rain, you know, and rain. Um, when Living Atoms did they put forth two little horns continually moving themselves. The place between the two horns was flat through the body was roundish. Um, I, you know, uh, there, there were four times the length in the whole body and the thickness looked like spider's web at the end of which appeared a globule, um, one of which was made up of a eh, body um, which could not be perceived even in very clear water. Little creatures, if they chanced to light on a filament or, yeah, um, or other th such particle in which there are many water, especially after half fl uh, flood, yeah, I don't know. Um, okay, and they were entangled whereby they came in pairs and their whole body would let back towards which together rolled like, rolled together like a serpent. And after the matter, uh, copper wire that had been wound uh, and unwound probably a couple of